Well, it is so good to be here this morning. I appreciate your presence. It is always an encouragement to be able to look out and see my brothers and sisters and to welcome those who are visiting with us. We're glad that you are here and encourage everybody to take a Bible and study along with us this morning. And I'm going to begin the lesson this morning with a shout out to Nathan Pepper. He, um, he's the inspiration behind this lesson. Now, what that means is if you like the lesson, you can thank Nathan, and if you don't like it, you can hold him responsible. But last Sunday we were talking about, or I talked about, Josiah, the righteous king of Judah, and how that Josiah enacted necessary reforms in Judah. And yet, those reforms were not able to change the hearts of people. It it spoke of how he made the people do this. Well, you can make people do things outwardly, but you can't change their hearts or you can't force them to change their heart. And we talked about the importance of our having a changed heart, serving God from the heart. And the question that Nathan suggested to me, the lesson, he he said, maybe a future lesson could be, how do we get our heart in that position to serve God? You know, we may be told, okay, you got to serve from the heart, but how do we go about changing our hearts? And, you know, I'll tell you just a little something. Sometimes people come up to me and say, I got an idea for a sermon. And sometimes I, I try to listen very politely and I'm thinking, well, that might make a Wednesday night talk. You know, it's a short and sometimes I'm thinking... Uh, not a chance in this world, you know, but, uh, you know, you try to be polite and smile and say, well, that's an interesting thought. But Nathan's got my wheels to turning immediately. And I want to think about some things that I believe go into it. And the first one is going back to last week. And that's realizing the need. You know, we, what we want is a worship and service to God that is not empty ritual. It's not just going through traditional actions that we've always done, but it's going to take effort. It takes effort to involve the mind, the heart, the inner being. And we need to understand the need for that. In Romans, the sixth chapter, we looked at a verse or two from this last week, but I want to remind you of something. In verse 3, Paul says, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And you jump to verse 17. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin... Yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. If you've heard me preach any at all, you know that I teach that baptism is necessary. That I teach that God requires this. But I don't go around grabbing folks and saying, okay, I'm going to baptize you. I don't push people to be baptized against their will. Because the baptism that saves is a baptism that is where one knows that they are uniting themselves with Christ in His death. They are committing themselves to rise up in newness of life. They are obeying from the heart. Our walk with God has to begin with an obedience from the heart. But it doesn't stop there. There are just a number of passages that emphasize our whole services from the heart. 1 Corinthians 11. We often read this at the time of the Lord's Supper. And I want to just highlight a few phrases. Verse 24, he says, Take, eat, this is my body. It's important that we eat the Lord's Supper in the way God prescribed. You know, 
there have been over the years debates about is unleavened bread required or is it acceptable to use leavened bread? Must we have only one container or may we have multiple containers? And I will tell you, those are not unimportant questions to ask. But even if we have all of that right, we have to do it in remembrance of Him. That I must be thinking of Jesus. In verse 25, you take the cup in remembrance of Him. Verse 27, therefore whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. What is the examining in verse 28? I think it, it could include examining one's life as far as sin and commitment to God goes. But in this context, it's really about what am I doing? You know, why am I eating this bread? Why am I drinking this cup? Am I discerning the Lord's body? The manner in which I partake, it matters. Not long ago, I did a lesson going over why I believe that instrumental music is not something that ought to be a part of our worship an unauthorized addition. But let's understand, we can omit instrumental music, we can only sing and yet not be right with God because Ephesians 5.19 says, making melody with the heart. Colossians 3.16, singing with grace, and some translations say with thankfulness in the heart. That it's not enough... Okay, I left off the instrument. I sang. Did I sing with thankfulness in the heart? These things matter. Hebrews 10, 22, as he is telling these Christians what a great privilege they have of coming to God, he said we have to draw near, verse 22, with a true heart in full assurance of faith. When I'm approaching God, it is with faith. It's with a pure heart. In 1 Peter, the the first chapter, verse 22, look how many ways he speaks of the love of the brethren, one aspect of our Christian service. In sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. I have, to do th- I have to love my brethren. I have to love them from the heart. I want us to understand there's a real danger that we become the people Jesus spoke of in Matthew 15. He says in verse 7 and 8, they draw near to me with their mouth, but their heart is far from me. And he said that's vain worship. That it is so easy to just find ourselves going through the motions. And I'm not talking strictly about worship, or solely about worship, I should say. Our whole lives, we do certain things because, well, I know God expects that. I abstain from certain things because I know they're prohibited. But my entire life is to be lived as a heartfelt devotion to God. But that's not always easy. How do I do that? Well, there's some passages. I want to start by saying, I don't want you to be stopped by fear of failure. It is easy to be distracted. And when you get distracted, we're eating the Lord's Supper. You know, it's very easy in a time of quiet reflection for the mind to temporarily wonder. You know, we're, we're singing from the heart and the song leader 
makes a mistake. Or, you know, sometimes there's a loud clap of thunder. And our mind goes off. And, and I go, well, I, I wasn't concentrating like I should have. And therefore, sometimes what happens is I just decide, well, I'm giving up. I become discouraged. Now, I want to pause and say, and minimize, eliminate distractions. You know, get rid of them. You know, our phones, our electronic Bibles, they can be tremendous distractions to us. And I understand there are some situations where there are people who need to keep their phone handy because of family members' situation. But in general, you know, my phone goes on, do not disturb. You know, I've got this older option. Those of you who know those, you know, first time I wore it during a service, I forgot about that. You know, I put my phone on vibrate and laid it down. My arm vibrated the whole time because, you know, it was stuff like, you know, there was a news alert. There was this sports alert. There was this. I learned, you've got to put it on do not disturb. You know, you do those things. There are things, you know, if you've got children, you know, sometimes realize as much as we love the children. And I don't, I don't want to be in a place where I'm never interrupted by a child crying out. That's a terrible thing. But realize sometimes in order not to be a distraction to others and not really to be a distraction to yourself, it's best to go out with a child. Uh, if you're not a child, go out only when necessary. You know, you're a distraction to yourself, you're a distraction to others. But we, if we do everything we can, everything we ought to be doing to eliminate distractions, Look, folks, they're still going to happen. You know, I, I've been up here preaching and had a page fall out of my Bible. Well, I know that, hey, it distracts me. And I know it throws your, you know, attention off for a moment. Those things happen. I want us to be aware. We've not lost. And it's also just true that when I take up the Christian walk, as, you know, I mean, throughout life, denying self, taking up the cross is going to be a challenge. But if you're talking about someone who has not been doing these things, and sometimes you can be a Christian a long time and you realize, hey, I need to do better. Breaking old habits is tough. Establishing new habits, it takes time to do that. And... Sometimes what that means is, you know, your heart may not always be in it. Yet you know, okay, this is something I've got to get done. I've got to do this. Look at a few passages with me that talk about the process of a Christian's life. Ephesians 4. He speaks of gifts that he has given to the church, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. What do they do? They equip the saints for the work of ministry. They produce the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into Him who is the head, Christ. This perfect man does not emerge from the waters of baptism. This perfect, complete man, this, this is a growth process. And what I'm trying to say to you is be patient with yourself. Realize that point number one, put forth the effort. Don't, un, you know, don't fail to see the need. But don't be discouraged. That, well, I messed up today. I might as well give up. No. Hebrews 5, 12 through 14 talks about being babes, taking the milk of the word, growing into maturity. It is a process. You know, 
even when it's a struggle. And, and sometimes the heart isn't, you know, examples I think about. Somebody who's never, as we like to say, gone to church. They've never been in the uh, habit of assembling with the saints for worship. It's not an easy habit to get into. Because they're used to Sunday morning was a time to sleep in. Or there's a lot of things going on on Sunday afternoons. You know, there, there are stores to be shopped in. There are ball games to be watched. There are fish to be caught. You know, there are, there, there's, there's a golf course that, to be played. You know, there are a lot of things that can be done on a Sunday afternoon. And getting that habit. And sometimes early on, I don't, I don't think it's an issue that I'm torn. You know, I, I, for many years, Sunday afternoon was my golfing day. And, and I'm, having to, I'm, I'm having to fight against that. Okay? In time, you'll find that the pull of the heart won't be as strong. Bible reading is another one of those. It takes some time to establish the habit. But the more you work at it, the more you, in the steps we're going to talk about, they help you. They will help us all. And one of those, and I think this is really important, and I think sometimes maybe I've overlooked this. Why is it done? Why am I asking people to come together and worship? Telling them to eat the Lord's Supper, sing these songs. If you want to involve the heart, you've got to know why you're doing it. Please don't eat the Lord's Supper just because, well, that's what we do. Sing songs because, well, that's what we do. You know, attend these assemblies. I want to challenge and encourage. Get in the book. Find out, are these things we're doing, are these just merely human traditions? Or are they what God wants us to do? You know, ask questions. Honest, sincere questions. Why do we do this? I don't understand this. Those questions ought to be well received. You know, if you ask me, I will try my best to give you an answer. And if, if I can't find a Bible answer, then we've got an issue. In Acts the 13th chapter, verse 27, there is something said here that I think teachers, parents really ought to think about when it comes to you know, parents, their children, teachers, elders, preachers, to everyone. Paul is preaching in Antioch of Pisidia, and he says in verse 27, For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, that is, did not know Jesus, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. They heard the prophets read on a weekly basis. Those who crucified Jesus... Those who rejected him, those were, they were the kind of people who went to synagogue. And they heard the prophets every week. And then here comes Jesus. And what to most of us would seem like the obvious fulfillment of the prophets. And they didn't see it. Though they had heard those prophets every week. And the point I want to make is, it may have been preached many times. It may have been said many times. Don't make the assumption that your children understand why we do these things. Don't, as preachers, I, I like as Paul Earnhardt used to say, I probably may still do, you know, you need to start with a blank piece of paper. Too many times I fear, I fear that I preach assuming people are already at a certain level. And I know I can't every time go back and start at the beginning because not all of you are at the beginning. 
But I think it is important that we go back as parents, as preachers, as teachers, and we start at the beginning and say, look, this is how we got to here. We didn't one day just come up and say this is what we're going to do. I believe there is biblical reason that we eat the Lord's Supper, that we sing, that we pray, that we gather. You know, that our hearts can truly be put into it because these are not empty traditions. But you know something, you've got to understand that for yourself. And that's where I want to say, it's not just on preachers and parents and elders and other Bible class teachers. If you don't understand it, and you're questioning, I don't know why we do this, then ask, study. And let me challenge you, if you're going to ask a question, make sure you're willing to hear the answer. Sometimes people ask questions, and they're not really asking. But if you, if you want to know, learn. And then, next step is have the proper fear of God. Fear alone is not enough motive to keep somebody in the race for the long haul. But the Bible does not speak of fear as something that is bad. Certain types of fear, yes. But Hebrews 12, 28 Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. I need to serve God with reverence. Not just eating, his, you know, eating the bread and drinking the cup. Not just singing the words to a song. Not just preaching a sermon. I need to serve Him with reverence and godly fear because He's a consuming fire. In the 10th chapter, I don't know how much stronger the words could be than when He says, if we sin willfully, verse 26, after we, we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses of how much worse punishment. Now just stop for, notice what he just said. They died without mercy. And then he says, worse punishment. Worse than death without mercy. Do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And we can go through many other passages. I need to read passages like that. I need to read Revelation 3 and read about the Laodiceans. Oh, they were neither hot nor cold. They weren't doing anything bad. But it's pretty obvious their heart wasn't in it. And Jesus is saying, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I need to read things like that. I need to read 1 Corinthians 11 again and again that he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself. There's a major difference, a major distinction to be made between somebody being stopped because, well, they're afraid they're not going to be perfect. And if they, if they you know, have any kind of imperfection in their worship, then, then God's going to lightning bolt them. No, we're human. Our, our minds are going to occasionally wander and we try to bring them back. But those who are not making that effort, they ought to fear and tremble before God. If I'm, not, if I'm only drawing near to God with my mouth but not my heart, then I ought to be terribly afraid. But then there's this, the other side of it. Let your mind dwell upon the love of God. 
We need to preach the authority of Jesus. All authority, he said, has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, 18. Verse 20, the conclusion of the Great Commission in Matthew's account is teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to those who obey him. Hebrews 5, 9. But let's see the love of Christ. We need to see the cross. We need to be drawn by a love so great that God would give his son for the world. John 3, 16. In Ephesians, the second chapter, he talks about where they once were. And that is, they were dead in sins. They were children of wrath. God's wrath was going to come upon them. But something happened. Look at verse 4. But God, in contrast to being dead in trespasses and sins, God intervened. Which God? The God who is rich in mercy. The God who saved us because of His great love with which He loved us. The God who by His grace saved us, verse 5. Verse 7, the God who showed the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. These are the kinds of things that my mind needs to dwell upon. I need to have that godly fear in me. But I need to be drawn by His love. The love that led Him to the cross. 1 John 5 and verse 3 says, For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. The more you know the love of God, the more you think about Jesus and His death, the more you think about all the ways that God's love has been shown the less burdensome the commandments of God become. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, he says, For the love of Christ compels us. Some translations say constrains us. He gets a hold of you. Because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Why would I give up things I want to do in order to live for Jesus? Because he died for me. Because he died for me and rose again. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. the more more deeply I appreciate the fact that every good thing I have, every good thing that I could ever have traces back to God, it will help me to live for Him, to love Him. And along that line, look to the reward. You know, Hebrews, the 12th chapter A passage in the auditorium class we've been using as one of our remembrance passages. He speaks of running the race with endurance. That's a challenge. It's so easy to get discouraged. It's so easy to just be overcome by all the discouragements and the temptations. He challenges us to run with endurance. How? Looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith. You set your mind upon Jesus. He is now at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, I'm looking at Him and running toward Him. Well, where is He? He's at the right hand of the throne of God. That's the direction I should be running in. In Colossians, the first chapter, He speaks of some things from the heart of the Colossians. We give thanks, verse 3, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always, since we heard of your 
faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. Faith, that's something that comes from within a person. Love is his attitude, a disposition. He says, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Why do they have faith in Christ? Why do they love their brethren? At least in part, because of that hope they had. That inheritance that Peter would describe as incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. We need to see that. I know that really getting the heart right with God, it's not easy. It's not nearly as difficult to say, okay, we're going to do this in the right manner physically. It's easy to not have instrumental music. It's much more challenging to sing from the heart, to truly remember the Lord's death, to love the brethren with a pure heart, to serve God not because I have to, not because it's my tradition, but because God's love has drawn me. But look at the difference between doing this and not doing it. In Matthew 25, verse 46, he says, as he's talked about those on the right hand and the left hand, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Eternal life, everlasting punishment. How can I get my heart right with God? Well, I've got to realize, first of all, I need to get my heart right with God. And I want to tell you, it's a journey. And don't be stopped by the fear of failure. Understand why we're doing the things we do. Have the right fear of God. Even more, dwell on the love of God and the promise He's given. With all of that, I believe we can do a better job of worshiping and serving God from the heart. That we can sing with thankfulness in our hearts. We can draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith as we do these things. This morning as we close, let me ask you, have you ever taken that initial step to obey from the heart, to be buried with Christ in baptism so you could be raised up to walk in newness of life? If you've not done that and you want to do that, we would gladly help you if you come as we stand and sing together. Thank you for watching this video. We're glad that you have found our channel. And in fact, while you're here, we would encourage you to subscribe to the Jones Road Church of Christ channel. We have several videos already up. And we believe you'll find these to be true to God's word, helpful to you in your journey toward God. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us and let us know how we can help you.